Hey, AP World History students, I'm Miss Sickler, and tonight we are going to be talking about the Industrial Revolution and completing your reading questions. They are in your notebooks. So when you get in here, let me know that you are here. I'm going to go ahead and pull up the textbook here. I also want to show you where your reading questions are in your notebook. They're actually in unit six, and they are uh, these questions right here. Hello, hello, welcome in. Drop your name in the chat when you get in here. We're gonna be doing your industrialization reading questions. They're actually in unit six in your notebook. I accidentally put them in the wrong unit, so sorry about that. Uh, hello, Tobina. Uh, Actually, I think it's Tobena, right? Um, I realized that I have been pronouncing your name wrong. I'm so sorry. Um, I listened to your uh, Flipgrid. It was really good. Hi, Fardine. Welcome in. So you're going to go to your notebook in Unit 6. The industrialization questions are there. It's actually Unit 5, but I put it in the wrong unit. So sorry. Hi, Catherine. Hi, Divya. Alejandro, I got Oswaldo. Welcome in, guys. All right, once you get to your reading questions there in Unit 6, there are only eight tonight, so hopefully we'll be able to finish. We're going to be on page 827 in your textbook. If you want to just follow along on my screen, that's fine, and you can um, do the reading questions like that. You don't necessarily have to open the textbook, but just remember, you access the textbook through the hub, and I'm going to show you that it's this right here. That's how you get to the textbook. I think most of you know that. But if you have any problems with that, just let me know. Hello, hello. Welcome in, T, Sebastian, and Sarah. Welcome in. Good to see you guys tonight. See you guys <laughs> in quotation marks. All right. So our first question for Industrial Revolution. Hi, Amelia. Welcome in is in what ways did the Industrial Revolution mark a sharp break with the past? And in what ways did it continue with earlier patterns? So we're looking at ways that it's different and ways that it's going to continue. That's our first question. Hey, Alina, welcome in. So for those of you who are listening for the first time, if there are any questions that you have while we're reading, make sure and drop them in the chat. Okay, we don't need that. All right, great. All right, so let's get going with explaining the Industrial Revolution. Remember, we're looking for how it broke with the past and how it was similar. Let me look at that question one more time. Uh, and how it continued with, with earlier patterns. All right, here we go. So the global context for this epochal economic transformation lies in a very substantial increase in human numbers from about 375 million people in 1400 to about 1 billion in the early 19th century. Accompanying this growth in population was an emerging energy crisis, most pronounced in Western Europe, China, and Japan as wood and charcoal. The major industrial fuels became scarcer and their prices rose. In short, global energy demands began to push against the existing local and regional economical limits. In broad terms, the Industrial Revolution marks a human response to that dilemma as non-renewable fuel, fossil fuels such as coal, oil, and natural gas replace the earlier reliance on the endlessly renewable energy source of wind, water, wood, and muscle power of people and animals. It was a breakthrough of unprecedented proportions that made available for human use, at least temporarily, immensely greater quantities of energy. So here's a way that it breaks from the past, right? It's talking about right here that in the past, let me get over here on this screen, in the past we used uh, sources for power such as wind, water, wood, and muscle power, and now they're going to start using fossil fuels. So you're going to want to put that down for question number one. This would be the past, the wind, water, wood, and muscle power, and then the future is the fossil fuels. Go. 
got 13 in here. All right. Good to have you guys. Make sure you've subscribed if you haven't done so already. <laughs> uh, I think most of you have, but that'll help with notifications. So you'll get notifications when we do lives. All right. Going on, it says it also wrought, of course, a mounting impact on the environment. You want me to give you a little bit more time? Sure, I can do that. It's hard sometimes to know how much time you guys need <laughs> in this digital world. Uh, which page are we on? We are on page 800 and something. Uh, 827. Okay. It also wrought, of course, a mounting impact on the environment. The massive extraction of non-renewable -renew raw materials to feed and to fuel industrial machinery, coal, iron, ore, petroleum, and much more altered the landscape in many places. Sewers and industrial waste emptied into rivers, turning them into poisonous cesspools. In 1858, the Thames River running through London smelled so bad that the British House of Commons had to suspend its session. Smoke from coal-fired industries and domestic use polluted the air in urban areas and sharply increased the incidence of respiratory illness. Against these conditions, a number of individuals and small groups raised their voices. Romantic poets such as William Blake and William Wordsworth invade against the dark satanic mills of industrial Europe and urged a return to the green and pleasant land of an earlier time. Here were early and local signs of what became by the late 20th century an issue of unprecedented and global proportions. For many historians, the Industrial Revolution marked a new era in human history and the history of the planet that scientists increasingly call the Anthropocene or the Age of Man. Increasingly, human industrial activity left a mark not only on human society, but also on ecological, atmospheric, and geological history of the Earth. So you definitely want to write something down about the fact that these renewable resources are causing pollution. You can put down that the sewers are going to empty directly into the river. And also the pollution of the factories. We also we, we talked about that when we did your notes on Industrial Revolution, that the pollution is just so bad. And even if you go to London today, you can still see the soot on the buildings from this time frame. Oh, uh, I think, yeah, um, Fardine, do you mean the page number in your notebook? In your notebook, it's in unit six. They're, they're supposed to be in unit five, but I accidentally put them in unit six. In the textbook, it's like eight, 827. Thank you, Amelia. I didn't even pick up on that. All right. You found it? Okay, great. We are on question one. More immediately and more obviously, however, access to huge new sources of energy gave rise to an enormously increased output of goods and services. In Britain, where the Industrial Revolution began, industrial output increased some 50-fold between 1750 and 1900. It was a wholly unprecedented and previously unimaginable jump in the capacity of human societies to produce wealth. Lying behind it was a great acceleration in the rate of technological innovation. Not simply this or that invention, the spinning jenny, the power loom, steam engine, or cotton gin, but a culture of innovation, a spread and almost obsessive belief that things could endlessly be improved. So 
Another break from the past is that we have all of this innovation, a lot of innovation, right? Not just one invention, but a lot of inventions. So put that down as well. And you can put some of these examples if you want. Sure, I can do that for you. Spinning Jenny, that's like a loom uh, to make shirts and uh, fabric. And then the power loom, steam engine, cotton gin. You guys will be um, looking at each other's flip grids next week. So you'll learn some more about these inventions. The flip grids I've watched so far are awesome. I'm loving it. It's even better to like see your faces <laughs> because I know what you look like now that I've seen you on Flipgrid. All right, we're gonna go on. Let me know if I need to slow down. Early signs of the technological creativity that spawned the Industrial Revolution appeared in 18th century Britain, where a variety of innovations transformed cotton textile production. It was only in the 19th century, though, that Europeans in general, and the British in particular, more clearly forged ahead of the rest of the world. The great breakthrough was the coal fire steam engine, which provided an intimate and almost limitless source of power or, sorry, inanimate, inanimate, and almost limitless source of power beyond that of wind, water, and muscle, and could be used to drive any number of machines as well as locomotives. So they're saying the big breakthrough here was the coal fire steam engine. That changed everything. Soon the Industrial Revolution spread beyond the textile industry to iron and steel production, railroads and steamships, food processing, and construction. Later in the 19th century, a so-called second industrial revolution focused on chemicals, electricity, preci precision machinery, the telegraph, the telephone, rubber, printing, and much more. Agriculture too was affected as mechanical reapers and chemical fertilizers, pesticides, and refrigeration transformed what uh, these most ancient industries. Technological innovation occurred in more modest ways as well. Patents for horseshoes in the United States, for example, grew from fewer than five per year before 1840 to 30 to 40 per year. So they're constantly making things better. Furthermore, industrialization soon spread beyond Britain to continental Western Europe, and then in the second half of the century to the United States, Russia, and Japan. So for question number one, let's summarize that a little bit, and you can say that it started, the break from the past started with the steam engine. And then it continued uh, with uh, iron and steel. The food processing. So we're just kind of summarizing this paragraph. Eventually that leads to chemicals and electricity. And uh, new agricultural techniques. Then it says, in the 20th century, the Industrial Revolution became global as a number of Asian, African, and Latin American countries developed a substantial industrial sectors. 
oil, natural gas, nuclear reactions joined coal as widely available sources of energy and new industries emerged in automobiles, airplanes, consumer durable products, electronics, computers, and on and on. It was a cumulative process that despite periodic ups and downs accelerated over time, more than anything else, this continuous emergence of new techniques of production together with massive economic growth they made possible and the environmental impact they generated marked the past 250 years. So things just continued to get better and better with industrial growth. Oops, I must have missed a sentence. Hold on. Ah, here we go. Okay. All right, so we need the last part of that question. In what ways did it continue with earlier patterns? And it said that at the very end of this paragraph, um, it says that this continuous emergence of technology or techniques of production with economic growth, so that continuous, so that's what I would put down for that is that it continued to progress with new technology and the economy continued to grow. Now, your next one asks, in what respects did the roots of the Industrial Revolution lie within Europe? And in what ways did the transformation have global roots? So how did it start in, or why did it start in Europe? Why is the roots there in Europe? And why, or how does it transform to kind of go global? That's what it's asking you. So this is a change question. One of the historical skills that you'll be learning to um, write for your essays is change in continuity. What things stay the same, what things change. This would be a change, okay? The Industrial Revolution has long been a source of great controversy among scholars. Why did it occur first in Europe? Within Europe, why did it occur earliest in Great Britain? And why did it take place in the late 18th and 19th centuries? Some explanations have sought the answer in unique and deeply rooted features of European society, history, or culture. One recent account, for example, argued that Europeans have been distinguished for several thousand years by a restless, creative, and freedom-loving culture with its roots in the aristocratic, warlike societies of early Indo-European invaders. While not denying certain distinctive qualities of the West, many world historians have challenged views that seem to suggest that Europe alone was destined to lead the way to the modern economic life. Such an approach, they argue, is not only Eurocentric and deterministic, but also flies in the face of much recent research. So Eurocentric means that Europe was the center of it all. And that's kind of what Europe wanted people to believe. But basically they're saying, hey, that's not accurate anymore because research has been done and we found that that's not correct. Historians now know that other areas of the world had experienced times of great technological and scientific flourishing. Between 750 to 1100 CE, the Islamic world generated major advances in shipbuilding, the use of tides and falling water to generate power, paper making, textile production, chemical technologies, water mills, clocks, and much more. India had long been the world center of cotton textile production. The first place to turn sugar cane juice into crystallized sugar and the source of many agricultural innovations and mathematical inventions. So right now what they're telling you is basically proof that Europe was not really the first with all these innovations, right? The way that they wanted people to believe. To the Arabs of the 9th century CE, India was a place of marvels, 
More than either of these, China was clearly the world's leader in technological innovation between 700 and 1400 CE, prompting various scholars to suggest that China was on the edge of an industrial revolution by 1200 or so. For reasons much debated among historians, all of these flowerings of technological creativity had slowed down considerably or stagnated by the early modern century or era when the pace of technological change in Europe began to pick up. But their earlier achievements certainly suggest that Europe was not alone in its capacity for technological innovation, nor did Europe enjoy any overall economic advantage as late as 1750. Over the past several decades, historians have carefully examined the economic conditions of various Eurasian societies in the 18th century and found a world of surprising resemblance. Economic indicators such as life expectancy, patterns of uh, consumption and nutrition, wage levels, general living standards, widespread free markets, and prosperous merchant communities suggest broadly similar conditions across the major civilizations of Europe and Asia. So they're saying, hey, basically the economic conditions were the same in Europe and Asia. So why did the Industrial Revolution start in Europe? Let's go to the next paragraph. A final reason for doubting a unique European capacity for industrial development lies in the relatively rapid spread of industrial techniques to many parts of the world over the past 250 years. A fairly short time by world history standards, Although the process has been highly uneven, industrialization has taken root to one degree or another in Japan, China, India, Brazil, Mexico, Indonesia, South America or South Africa, Saudi Arabia, Thailand, South Korea, and elsewhere. Such a pattern weakens any suggestion that European culture or society was exceptionally compatible with industrial development. So they can't say that like the Europeans were just better and that's why it started there because it spread to other places. That's what they're arguing right there. Thus, while sharp debate continues, many contemporary historians are inclined to see the Industrial Revolution erupting rather quickly and quite unexpectedly between 1750 and 1850. Two intersecting factors help to explain why this process occurred in Europe rather than anywhere else. Here you go. Here's your answer. One lies in certain patterns of Europe's internal development that favored innovation. So Europe had an internal, internal development favoring innovation. That's one reason. Internal development that favored innovation. It's many small and highly competitive states taking shape in the 12th and 13th centuries arguably provided an insurance against economic and technological st stagnation, uh, which the larger Chinese, Ottoman, and Mughal empires perhaps lacked. If so, when Western Europe's failure to recreate the earlier unity of the Roman Empire may have acted as a stimulus to innovation. Okay, furthermore, the relative newness of these European states and their monarchs, desperate need for revenue in the absence of an effective tax collecting bureaucracy pushed Europe royals into an unusual alliance with the merchant classes. Small groups of merchant capitalists might be granted specific privileges, monopoly, or even tax collecting responsibilities in exchange for much needed loans or payments to the state. So the royals needed money. This is another reason the royals needed money. And they partnered with the merchant class. Then it says, thus states granted charters and monopolies to private trading companies and governments, founded scientific societies, and offered prizes to promote innovation. 
In this way, European merchants and other innovators from the 15th century onward gained an unusual degree of freedom from state control and in some places a higher social status than their counterparts in established civilizations. So merchants had social status and power more so than in other parts of the world. Then it says, by the 18th century, major Western European societies were highly commercialized and governed by states supportive of private commerce. In short, they were well on their way toward capitalist economies where building and selling on the market was a widely established practice before they experienced industrialization. So they were already kind of like on their way to that before industrialization happens. Such internally competitive economies coupled with a highly competitive system of rival states arguably fostered innovation in the new civilization taking shape in Western Europe. Europe's societies, of course, were not alone in developing market-based economies by the 18th century. Japan, India, and especially China were likewise highly commercialized or market-driven. However, in the several centuries after 1500, Western Europe was unique in another way. Pay attention to this because this is what you want to put down too. That region alone found itself at the hub of the largest and most varied network of exchange in history. Widespread contact with culturally different people was yet another factory that historically has generated extensive change and innovation. This new global network, largely the creation of Europeans themselves, greatly energized commerce and brought Europeans into direct contact with the people around the world. So this is how it globalizes. Europe is right in the center of all of that. So put down that Europe is in the center of this global trade network. And they have contact with different cultures. On both sides. We have the Americas and we have Asia and Africa. Europe's right in the center of all of that. And here's an example. For example, Asia, home to the world's richest and most sophisticated societies, was the initial destination of European voyages of exploration. The German philosopher Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz encouraged Jesuit missionaries in China not to worry so much about getting things European to the Chinese, but rather about getting remarkable Chinese inventions to us. Inexpensive and well-made Indian textiles began to flood into Europe causing one English observer to note almost everything that used to be made of wool or silk relating either to dress of the women or the furniture of the houses was supplied by the Indian trade. The competitive stimulus of these Indian cotton textiles was certainly one factor driving innovation in British textile industry. Likewise, the popularity of Chinese porcelain and Japanese lacquerware prompted imitation and innovation in Europe, France, and Holland. Thus, competition for desirable, high-quality, and newly available Asian goods played a role in stimulating European or Europe's industrial revolution. So you're going to put something along the lines that all of these products that are coming in from around the world are spurring on English innovation. They want to be able to compete.
in the Americas, Europeans found a windfall of silver that allowed them to operate in Asian markets. They also found timber, fish, maize, potatoes, and much else to sustain a growing population. Later, slave-produced cotton supplied an emerging textile industry with its key raw material at low prices, while sugar, similarly produced with slave labor, furnished cheap calories to European workers. Europe's Industrial Revolution, con concluded historian Peter Stearns, stemmed in great part from Europe's ability to draw disp disproportionately on world resources. So they're taking advantages of the resources of the world. The New Society of the Americas further offered a growing market for European machine-produced goods and generated substantial profits for European merchants and entrepreneurs. So you're going to say that America provided raw materials for Europe. As well as a new market to sell manufactured goods. Oh, is this still question? Yeah, I could say, I guess we could say this is still question number two. Thus, the intersection of new, highly commercialized, competitive European societies with the novel global network of their own making provides a context for understanding Europe's Industrial Revolution. Commerce and cross-cultural exchange acting in tandem, that means acting at the same time together, sustained the impressive technological changes of the first industrial societies. So how does it take global root? You can say that it has to do with commerce and cross-cultural exchange spurred on the Industrial Revolution. Question number three is, what was distinctive about Britain that may help to explain its status as the breakthrough point of the Industrial Revolution? So that part was just about why does it start in Europe? Now we need to find out why is Great Britain the place that it, it starts and then spreads throughout Europe, okay? So if the Industrial Revolution was initially a Western Europe phenomenon generally, it clearly began in Britain in particular. The world's first industrial revolution unfolded spontaneously in a country that concentrated some of the more general features of European society. It was both unplanned and unexpected. With substantial imperial possessions in the Caribbean, in North America, and by the late 18th century in India as well, talking about colonies, Britain was the most highly commercialized of Europe's larger countries. Its landlords had long ago enclosed much of an agricultural land, pushing out the small farmers and producing for the market. We talked about that, the enclosure movement. A series of agricultural innovations, crop rotation, selective breeding of animals, lighter plows, and higher yielding seeds increased agricultural output, kept food prices low, and freed up labor from the countryside. So here's some reasons already. You can say... Um, I don't know why that did that on my computer. Okay, so you can say the enclosure movement. New agricultural innovations. Such as uh, the crop rotation. and higher yielding seeds, uh, all of that keeps food prices low.
It also frees up labor from the countryside. The guilds, which earlier had protected Britain's urban artisans, had largely disappeared by the 18th century, allowing employers to run their manufacturing enterprises as they saw fit. Coupled with a rapidly growing population, these processes ensured a ready supply of industrial workers who had few alternatives available to them. Furthermore, British aristocrats, unlike their counterparts in Europe, had been long interested in the world of business, and some took part in new mining and manufacturing enterprises. British commerce, moreover, extended around the world. Its large merchant fleet protected by the Royal Navy. The wealth of empire and global commerce, however, were not themselves sufficient for the spawning Industrial Revolution for Spain. The earliest beneficiary of American wealth was one of the slowest industrializing European countries into the 20th century. So they're saying here that these similar things were happening in Spain, but it didn't give them the edge, whereas it gave the British the edge. And then it'll explain a little bit more here in a minute why that was. But another reason that you can put down is that uh, the British, British aristocrats wanted to invest in business. British political life encouraged commercialization and economic innovation. So once again, here is um, the, the government that is encouraging this. So put down that the government, I can't spell tonight, government encouraged businesses. and economic innovation. So they're going to pass laws that will support that. The British government favored men of business with tariffs that kept out cheap Indian textiles with laws that made it easy to form companies and to build, bid workers unions with roads and canals that helped create a unified internal market and with patent laws that served to protect the interest of the investors. So an example of how they're protecting um, business, let's see, an uh, example you could put down is that they um, protected them with tariffs to keep out cheap Indian uh, textiles. and uh, laws that would forbid unions. Remember unions are uh, protection for the workers. So they can basically treat the workers however they want because there's no unions. Okay, then it says Europe's scientific revolution also took a distinctive form in Great Britain in ways that fostered technological innovation. So the scientific revolution happens differently in Great Britain than it did in the rest of Europe. Whereas science on the continent was largely based on logic, deduction, and mathematical reasoning, in Britain it was much more concerned with observation, experiment, precise measurements, mechanical devices, and practical commercial applications. Discoveries about atmospheric pressure and vacuums, for example, played an important role in the invention and the improvement of the steam engine. So you want to put down that the scientific revolution um, was more geared towards having practical commercial uses.
And then uh, you can say such as uh, innovation that led to the steam engine. Even though most inventors were artisans or craftsmen rather than science scientists, in the 18th century Britain, they were in close contact with scientists, makers of scientific instruments, and entrepreneurs, whereas in continental Europe, these groups were largely separate. The British Royal Society, an association of natural philosophers or scientists, established in 1660, saw its role as one of promoting useful knowledge. To this end, it established mechanics libraries, published broadsheets and pamphlets on recent scientific advances, and held frequent public lectures and demonstrations. So they were more into researching science to be useful. Let's go to the next paragraph. Finally, several accidents of geography and history contributed something to Britain's Industrial Revolution. The country had a ready supply of coal and iron. So that's another one that you can put down. Geography worked in their advantage. They had coal and iron. Similar to why Europe was successful in dominating the world. Remember with germs, guns, and steel? Geography starts it all. Uh, let's see. Although Britain took part in wars against Napoleon, the country's island location protected it from the kind of invasions that so many continental European states experienced during the era of the French Revolution. Moreover, Britain's relatively, relatively fluid society allowed for adjustments in the face of social changes without widespread revolution. By the time the dust settled from the immense disturbance of the French Revolution, Britain was well on its way to coming the world's first industrial society. All right, so all those things lead to Britain being the first. Our next question is, how did Britain's middle class change during the 19th century? Let's see where that one is at. Uh, okay, so here's um, Britain's middle class. Let's read a little bit about the aristocracy. Uh, so I'm on page whatever this is. I don't know what page, I don't know why my page numbers aren't coming up. There it is, page 836, the British aristocracy. It says, individual landowning aristocrats, long the dominant class in Britain, suffered little in material terms from the Industrial Revolution. In the mid-19th century, a few thousand families still owned more than half the cultivated land in Britain. Most of it leased to tenant farmers who, in turn, employed agricultural wage laborers to work it. Rapidly growing population and urbanized urbanization sustained a demand for food products grown on that land for most of the 19th century. Landowners continue to dominate the British Parliament, so the landowners are in control of the government. As a class, however, the British aristocracy declined as a result of the Industrial Revolution, as have large landowners in every industrial society. As urban wealth became more important, landed aristocrats had to make way for the up-and-coming businessmen, manufacturers, and bankers newly enriched by the Industrial Revolution. The aristocracy's declining political clout was demonstrated in the 1840s when high tariffs on foreign agricultural imports designed to protect the interests of British landlords were finally abolished. By the end of the century, land ownership had largely ceased to be based on great wealth and businessmen, rather than aristocrats, led the major political parties. So they're going to have this switch where the aristocrats are going to kind of go out and the businessmen are going to come in to the, the government. Let's go down and look at the middle class. Your question is, how did Britain's middle class change during the 19th century? Those who benefited most conspicuously from industrialization were members of the amorphous group known as the middle class. At its upper levels, this middle class contained extremely wealthy factory and mine owners, bankers, and merchants. Such rising businessmen readily assimilated into aristocratic life, buying country houses, 
obtaining seats in Parliament, sending their sons to Oxford and Cambridge University, and gratefully accepting titles of nobility from the Queen Victoria. Far more numerous were the smaller businessmen, doctors, lawyers, engineers, teachers, journalists, scientists, and other professionals required in any industrial society. Such people set, set the tone for a distinctively middle-class society with its own values and outlooks. Politically, they were liberals favoring constitutional government, private property, and free trade. What are we answering here? How did it change during the 19th century? Okay. Uh, their agitation resulted in the Reform Bill of 1832, which broadened the right to vote to many men of the middle class, but not to middle class women. So you can put down one way that it changed in 1832. Middle class men got the right to vote. Then it says, ideas of thrift and hard work, a rigid morality and cleanliness characterize middle class culture. The central value of that culture was respectability, a term that combined notions of social status and virtuous behavior. Nowhere were these values more effectively displayed than in the Scotsman Samuel Smiles famous book, Self Help, published in 1859. Individuals are responsible for their own destiny, Smiles argued. An hour a day devoted to self-improvement would make an ignorant, ignorant man wise in a few years. Let's go to the next page and see what he says. Women in such middle class families were increasingly cast as homemakers, wives and mothers, charged with creating an emotional haven for their men and a refuge for the heartless and cutthroat capitalist world. They were also expected to be the moral centers of the family life, the educators of respectability, and the managers of household consumption as shopping, a new concept in the 18th century. So put down shopping for one of the changes. Becomes a central activity for the middle class. And this is because mass consumerism is easier to do in an industrial society, right? They have products from the factories to buy. An ideology of domesticity defined homemaking, child rearing, charitable endeavors, and refined activities such as embroidery, music, and drawing as the proper sphere of women, while paid employment and public sphere of life outside the home beckoned to men. Male elites in many civilizations had long established their status by detaching women from productive labor. The new wealth of the Industrial Revolution now allowed large numbers of families to aspire to this kind of status. With her husband as provider, such a woman, woman was now a lady. She must not work for profit, wrote the English woman Margarita Gregg in 1853, or engage in any occupation that money can command. Employing even one servant became a proud marker of such middle class status. So another change of middle class is that they could employ servants. Okay, um, by the late 19th century, some middle class women began to enter the teaching and clerical and nurse professions. And in the second half of the century, educated middle class women flooded into the labor force. By contrast, the withdrawal of children from productive labor into schools has proved a more enduring phenomenon as industrial economies increasingly required a more educated workforce. So you're going to say that um, eventually women joined the workforce. Now, remember, this is just middle class. The work, worker class is always going to have women working. And then you're also going to put down that um, middle class children attended school. As Britain's industrial economy matured, it also gave rise to a sizable lower middle class, which included people employed in the growing service sector as clerks, salespeople, 
bank tellers, hotel staff, secretaries, telephone operators, police officers, and the like. By the end of the 19th century, this growing segment of the middle class represented about 20% of Britain's population and provided new employment opportunities for women as well as men. In just 20 years, the number of female secretaries in Britain rose from 7,000 to 90,000. Almost all were single and expected to return to the home after marriage. Telephone operators had initially been boys or men, but by the end of the 19th century in both Britain and the United States, that work had become wholly female occupation. For both men and women, such employment represented a claim on membership in the larger middle class and a means of distinguishing themselves from the working class tainted by manual labor. Have you guys seen Downton Abbey? That's the perfect explanation of this time frame <laughs> because Downton Abbey has like the rich aristocrats and they have servants. And then as you're watching it, it kind of like goes into um, where the servants start to get more opportunities and more education. Um, it's, it's really good if you haven't seen it. Okay, so earlier, did you say that the middle class women got the right to vote? No, not the middle class women, the middle class men would have gotten the right to vote, I think. Let me look here. Uh, I think it was the men. The women didn't get the right to vote until the 1900s, I believe. Let me see if I can find it. Because they got the right to vote, I think, right before the women here in the United States did. Yeah, so in, in 1832, the right to vote was given to men of the middle class, but not middle class women. All right, now we're going to go on to the laboring class. And let's see what question. How did the Industrial Revolution transform British society? Uh, we might be able to answer that question by looking at the laboring class. Let's see. Let's see where that one is. If you haven't noticed, these questions are usually on the side of the textbook. I don't see that one, though. Okay, let's read the laboring class real quick. And then we'll try to find that other one. Uh, so the overwhelming majority of Britain's 19th century population, some 70% or more, were neither aristocrats nor members of middle class. They were manual workers in mines, ports, factories, construction sites, workshops, and farms of industrializing Britain. Okay, we'll look at that one. Um, although their conditions varied considerably and changed over time, it was the laboring classes who suffered most and benefited least from the Industrial Revolution. What's number five? Let's see. Oh, yeah. How, how, that's the one we were looking for, Tabana. Because uh, we've already done number four. Okay, yeah. All right, so um, just write down like underneath number four that the laboring class is 70% of the population. 70% of the population. The lives of the laboring classes were shaped primarily by new working conditions of industrial era. Chief among these conditions were rapid urbanization. Liverpool's population alone grew from 77,000 to 400,000 in the first half of the 19th century. By 1851, a majority of Britain's population lived in towns and cities. So we had this mass uh, urbanization which we talked about. Let's skip to the next paragraph. These cities were vastly overcrowded and smoky and wholly inadequate sanitation, periodic epidemics, endless row houses, so they're very crowded, polluted water supply. Let's skip down here to this sentence. Uh, by 1850, the average life expectancy was only 39 and a half years old. Not very old, okay? I am 38 <laughs> so I would only have about a year and a half left. That's kind of scary. So not very old, right? <laughs> All right, let's skip to the next paragraph. The industrial factories to which growing numbers of desperate people looked for employment offered a work environment far different from the artisan shop or the tenant farm. So this is what we were talking about the other day when we were talking about how it goes from cottage industry to factory. Um, I think I might have skipped something, though. Hold on. 
Oh, for, for an account of a young woman's factory experience, a girl, uh, oh, see this, okay, sorry. Uh, so to, this is an account of a young woman's factory experience. Basically, it's not good. Uh, a lot of abuse is going on with these women, um, and they're just being treated hor very horribly. Long hours, low wages, child labor, nothing new for the poor, but the routine and the monotony of the work dictated by the factory whistle and the needs of machines imposed novel and highly unwelcome conditions of labor. Also objectable were the direct and constant supervision from uh, the higher ups, the, the managers. OK, so just keep in mind factory work, long, monotonous, not good. OK. In the early decades of the 19th century, Britain's industrialists favored girls and young unmarried women as employees. So you're going to have girls and unmarried women working in the textile mills because they would work for lower wages. Makes sense, right? Why they would hire them if they're going to work for lower wages. Let's look down here at this one. It says, thus, unlike their middle class counterparts, many girls and young women of the laboring class engaged in industrial work or found jobs as domestic servants for upper or middle class families. So as I was telling you before, the middle class women are eventually going to join the workforce in some areas, but definitely not in the factories. That would just be the lower laboring class. All right. So we're looking for how... It transformed British society. Definitely one way that it transforms British society is that the middle class is going to grow and have more government power or political power. So for number five, middle class grows and gains more political power. And also you can put the laboring class has more um, monotonous work in the factories. All right, I'm just going to check here. That part about socialism is important. Okay, and then this goes into Russia. Okay. All right, so social protest. What happens as a result of all this going on? Now, there's no question about this one. So I'm going to teach you a little trick that I learned in college on reading a little bit quicker if you don't have a lot of time. In some history courses in college, I had to read like four or five books all at one time. And you just don't have time to do that. And so one of the tricks that my professors told us to do was to read the first sentence and then read like a middle sentence and then read the end sentence. And you should get the gist of the paragraph from that. So we're going to try this with this social protest and kind of summarize it. All right. So here we go with the first sentence. For workers of the laboring class, industrial life was a stony desert, which they had to make it habitable for their own efforts. Such efforts took many forms. Now let's read in the middle. Other skilled artisans who had been displaced by machine-produced goods and forbidden to organize in legal unions sometimes wrecked the offending machinery and burned the mills that had taken their jobs. And that leads us to the last sentence. The class consciousness of working people was such that one police informer reported that most every creature of the lower class order, both in town and country, are on their side. So life is really hard, right? They're not ha getting paid decent, um, and they're, they're getting their jobs taken away by machinery, okay? That's the gist of that paragraph. 
Others acted within political arena by joining movements aimed at obtaining the vote for the working class men, a goal that was gradually achieved in the second half of the 19th century. So others are going to try to fight with the government. One British newspaper in 1834 described unions as the most dangerous institutions that were ever permitted to take root under shelter of law, although they later became more respectable organizations. So we know that unions were outlawed and then later they're going to be allowed. Socialist ideas of various kinds gradually spread within the working class, challenging the assumption of capitalist society. Capitalist is free market. Okay, the government doesn't control any of the market. Socialist, though, the government would have some control. So now those ideas are going to start to spread. And then it says this guy right here, Robert Owen, established one such community with a 10-hour workday, spacious housing, decent wages, and education for the children at a mill in Scotland. Of more lasting significance was the socialism of Karl Marx. So put his name down in your notes, Karl Marx. German by birth, Marx spent much of his life in England where he witnessed the brutal condition of Britain's Industrial Revolution and wrote voluminously about history and economics. So he witnessed it, didn't like what he was seeing. Let's go to the next paragraph. In his writings, the combined impact of Europe's industrial and political and scientific revolutions found expression. Industrialization created both the social conditions against which Marx protested so bitterly an enormous wealth he felt would make socialism possible. So he's protesting against this wealth. Let's skip ahead in that paragraph. Uh, his was therefore a scientific socialism embedded in these laws of historical change. Revolution was a certainty and socialist future inevitable. So he was thinking that people will eventually revolt against all of this madness, this labor of, uh, and this misery. It was a grand, compelling, prophetic, utopian vision of human freedom and community, and it inspired socialist movements of workers and intellectuals among amid the grim harshness of Europe's industrialization in the second half of the 19th century. So he's inspiring them to revolt. These parties recruited members, contested elections as they gained the right to vote, and agitated for reforms, and in some cases plotted revolution. So do you see how this strategy kind of works? We're not reading all of it, but you're still getting the gist of what this is saying to you. And that's the important part. In the later decades of the 19th century, such ideas echoed among more radical trade unionists and some middle class intellectuals in Britain, and even more so in rapidly industrializing Germany and elsewhere. By then, however, the British working class movement was not overtly revolutionary. So let's go down here a little bit further and see if we can pick up uh, the last sentence. It says, generally known as social democracy, this approach to socialism was especially prominent in Germany during the late 19th century and spread more widely in the 20th century. So it really didn't take hold in Britain. When it came into conflict with the more violent revolutionary movements and call uh, who called it communist. So this is the... The roots of communism is socialism, the government having control of things and everybody having their fair share. That will eventually get a little bit more extreme and be called communist. Um, proving material conditions during the second half of the 19th century helped to move the working class movement in Britain, Germany, and elsewhere away from the revolutionary posture. So right here is why it didn't take hold in Great Britain and Germany because there were improvements in the working conditions. So put that down somewhere underneath. I, this doesn't go with a question, but just say that socialism never took hold because of improvement of working conditions. Socialism, I need to spell that right. There we go. Okay. Now, your next question is about Russia and the United States. 
And this is a variation on theme. So industrialization in the United States and Russia. So it's probably going to talk about similarities and differences. And number six says, what were the differences between industrialization in the U.S. and in Russia? So that is going to be in this section right here. And then you have two more after that. The factors contributing to making the revolutionary situation in Russia. And then the one about Latin America. So you've only got to read. Okay, so right here is the differences. And then, let's see if we can find the other one. There's the other one. And then Latin America will probably be right after Russia. So you only have three questions left. And here's Latin America right here. I'm going to let you do those last three on your own, six, seven, and eight. And that would start, let me see what page that starts on so you can take note of that. Well, maybe. That starts on page. Wait for it, wait for it. Oops, no, I went too far. I went too far. Here it is right here. Yep, here we go. Page 846. So that's going to start on page 846. That's where you need to start for question number six. Anybody have any questions about what we've read tonight? Let me know. All right. Wonderful AP World students. Thank you so much for joining in tonight. I had fun reading with you all. And uh, just let me know if you need questions with those last three, but they should be pretty simple since you know where they're at. Have an awesome night. And if I don't see you tomorrow, have a wonderful weekend. If I do see you tomorrow, we're starting the DBQ. How exciting. So get lots of sleep so you can listen up in class. I'll talk to you guys tomorrow. Thanks for joining once again and have a good night.